we have actually two stories this week. Uh, first one is out of New York, right? Can you give us a little detail? We got an update on the, the, the case against New York's latest gun restrictions. There was a federal judge that issued uh, a temporary restraining order blocking enforcement of most of the controversial provisions like the Times Square gun ban, the public uh, transit gun ban, the, the, uh, <laughs> the, the just a magnitude of, of gun bans across the state that made it very difficult to carry a gun legally almost anywhere uh, in New York, including private businesses uh, that, that uh, operate, you know, open to the public. That was blocked as well. What is what's happened now? Yeah, so like like you pointed out, there was a temporary restraining order issued on most of those provisions, um, but it was delayed by three business days to allow for the state of New York to decide if they wanted to appeal or not. And of course they did. Um, so for a while, we didn't hear anything. We we're kind of wondering, oh, maybe nothing's going to happen. Um, but th the day before the temporary restraining order was supposed to take effect, uh, a single judge from the Second Circuit came out and issued basically an administrative stay on that restraining order, not allowing that block to go into effect because essentially what happened is the second circuit hasn't even gotten to this matter yet. Uh, and so basically it was just to delay, delay the block from going into effect until a three judge panel of the second circuit actually sits down and takes a look on the merits of New York's appeal to once again, block the temporary restraining order. Yeah. I think it's, uh, it's even less, uh, severe than that, okay. I guess. It was a temporary stay on a temporary restraining order, which is funny enough, but, but, uh, I think it's only blocking it until that panel right. is sat and then decides on whether or not to right. continue this stay and then goes to the merits. So it may not last very long. It's not clear. You know, obviously the second circuit has been traditionally pretty, uh, friendly towards the government in these cases, uh, upholding a lot of gun restrictions. But of course, the major difference now is that they have to operate under the Bruin standard, which is uh, a higher bar to clear for government regulation of firearms, uh, which the lower court judge obviously uh, was ruling under and, and found all of these provisions to be unconstitutional uh, or likely unconstitutional. He didn't rule on the merits. He, he Although his ruling notes that, you know, the, the standard for temporary restraining order and the standard for preliminary injunction are basically the same thing. So um, it was, with courts, you know, there's always like, well, they're blocking it, but it, there's not a full ruling on the merits. Technically, you know, there's a lot of technicalities when it comes to legal situations, of course. And so this one is this this story is filled with them because we're now like, like I said, we're in a temporary stay of a temporary restraining order that's stayed until a uh, three judge panel. It was stayed by a single judge until a three judge panel can look at the stay and see if it should continue to go on. Um, but we'll, we'll see how that happens. You know, obviously stays are pretty common in these kinds of cases, especially if you're in a circuit that uh, if you're a gun rights plaintiff and you're in a circuit that's not very friendly towards gun rights plaintiffs, you even if you get a good ruling from a lower court judge, you're often going to have your your uh, case stayed pending appeal so that the government can continue enforcing its laws. I, you know, whether that's the right approach is uh, leave that up for other people. I, it's personally, I don't I don't love it. I would prefer in a case where uh, a law was ruled to be unconstitutional, that it not be allowed to remain in effect uh, while the case is decided. But uh, you know, I'm not a federal judge, so. <laughs> well, especially because the whole rationale behind a temporary restraining order is plaintiffs are likely to, to suffer harm if this keeps being forced. So to put a stay on something that puts them at risk of suffering harm is is interesting. Yeah, I mean, they could be they could be arrested. But I mean, that's the idea. Of, you can make that argument with pretty much every stay that gets put in place on on a, a ruling against a, a particular law. Uh, so it's not exactly a, a new thing or an uncommon thing or or something that's, uh, you know, uh, the restricted to gun cases. This happens across the board. But uh, that's the latest in that case. So, uh, you know, New Yorkers who are listening to this, just make sure that you stay up to date with that, because uh, one day it might seem like uh, it's legal for you to do something. And the next day it goes back to being a felony. So uh, uh, technically, in this case, it, it was it remained in effect the whole time. But, um, you know, 
I'm sure people were anticipating that maybe by well, Wednesday or Thursday this week, it was going to, uh, the, the enforcement was going to be blocked and it turns out that that's not the case. So it's important that everybody understands that. Um, but we also have another story and this one deals with Mexico, right? Yeah. So Mexico is back in court. Um, we covered previously their attempt to sue a lot of the big gun manufacturers, um, like Smith and Wesson Glock is a whole host of, of major gun manufacturers. Um, and it was tossed because the judge ruled that it was precluded by the PLCAA, the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act, which basically shields these gun companies from liability for third party misuse of legally sold firearms. Mm -hmm. um, so that was dismissed two weeks ago. And Mexico came right back and filed another suit, uh, this time in federal court in Arizona against five just FFLs, basically gun dealers that are kind of located near that border down there in southern Arizona, essentially making a similar argument that these Gun dealers are negligent in allowing their guns to be sold to straw purchasers who then traffic them into Mexico and, and supply cartels. And um, so it's, it's a similar situation where, once again, they're trying to sue the U.S. gun industry for the violence that takes place in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Now, you read the complaint. Did they offer any specific evidence of these gun dealers being involved in, you know, trafficking of guns or intentionally selling guns to people they knew weren't allowed to buy them? Well, they, they provided specific examples of straw purchasers being caught who had purchased those guns at these particular stores. Right. But th they're mostly just accusations about, well, they should have known that they were straw purchasers. They never make yeah. any claims that they sold them without background checks or that they knew that the person was lying about whether they were going to be the sole possessor of the gun. It's right. basically just an insinuation that, oh, they should have known. So Yeah, so no direct evidence then. Uh, and, and they made a number of claims, and it seemed like, None of them were backed up with direct hard evidence that these right. gun dealers actually committed any crimes of any sort. Because, uh, like you said, I mean, a straw, straw purchase, that's when somebody who can legally buy gun, uh, buy a gun goes in and buys a gun, but does so with the intention of, of giving it or selling it to somebody else who they know cannot legally own or possess a gun. And, and uh, so that's very difficult for a gun dealer to uh, be able to know off the bat. I mean, if this is the kind of person who will pass a background check. That's the whole idea of this, this uh, particular tactic for gun runners or gun traffickers is that they know that these people are not going to get caught uh, in the system. Now they may get caught later on, hopefully, right? That's the goal. Uh, or, you know, and a gun dealer might have uh, an intuition, an, <coughs> sorry, uh, an intuition that there, there's something off about the buyer or they might, you know, notice something and report them to the ATF. That's a very common thing. That's uh, talked that, about that at, at length uh, on this podcast and, and in our reporting about how, you know, the industry and the ATF work together often in these sorts of cases where um, people, dealers might suspect somebody of being, uh, you know, a straw purchaser. They'll, they'll report that. But, but, you know, unless there's some evidence that these dealers knew that the purchasers were, in fact, straw buyers, uh, you know, this whole lawsuit seems doomed to fail. And I, and honestly, and I think you this was in your piece, but um, although I might have written it in there, I don't remember <laughs> to edit the piece. But uh, uh, if they had hard evidence of this. Presumably, they would go to law enforcement. They would go to the ATF and share that evidence so that these dealers could be prosecuted instead of suing them in civil court as their sort of backup suit for when their previous suit failed. Yeah. Yeah. Like you said, it's a federal crime if you're abetting a, a gun yeah. trafficking ring with straw purchases. Like right. I said, it seems like law enforcement would be perhaps the more sensible route to go. Um, yeah, not a RICO but, suit, which... Uh, right, I mean, yeah, look, yeah, they file a RICO suit, which once again, like yeah. most people, if you're a lawyer listening yeah. to this, you know how silly that is and how mi misused RICO statutes are in plaintiff-led litigation. So Exactly. I mean, we're not lawyers, but we follow uh, uh, lawsuits pretty closely here. And uh, I think one of the things that's a red flag for whether a lawsuit is serious or not is whether it's trying to make a bunch of RICO claims uh, right. which almost never succeed. Uh, so, so, uh, you know, it's, uh, this is, is a, it's an, it's a weird, 
it's a weird situation to me. Um, you wrote in a whole analysis piece about this for members, but I don't, I don't understand Mexico, the Mexican government's motivations here. It seems like a, a high risk thing to do for what's basically just a symbolic gesture, uh, you know, be, high risk in the sense that like, this is likely to alienate a lot of uh, Americans, especially lawmakers, especially, you know, Republicans or, or pro-gun uh, lawmakers, uh, especially those in border states, right? Like Arizona and, and Mexico, uh, or sorry, Arizona and, and Texas, uh, where you have a lot of Republican uh, lawmakers. And, uh, you know, it just, there it's very unlikely they're going to win this case just to be flat out about it, you know? And so, I don't know. Uh, you, you had a, you had some guesses at the the potential motivation here. Uh, it seems it seems like a just a symbolic thing, right? Is that, that right? Was, yeah, uh, I think it's it, it, it's a good point to make that they that you risk alienating people, and the the symbolism is perhaps maybe to say, you know, to show that the government can go back to its people and say, look what we're doing to help stem cartel violence that's terrorizing your lives that we haven't been able to get a a good grasp on. So. If we can stick it to right. those Americans that are fueling the violence, maybe that's a political win for them. I, I, it's yeah, tough to say. I guess that seems to be the calculation. I mean, obviously, this is also driven uh, in large part by uh, gun, American gun control groups. In this case, it's uh, Brady uh, United uh, was uh, one of the parties involved in this case and helping file it. Uh, this is part of a larger effort to try and pierce the the shield of uh, PLCAA that's been ongoing for decades, right? Um, you know, it's not um, a new tactic necessarily. It's a little bit different to try and rope in a, a, a foreign government right. to uh, be involved in this case. But, uh, you know, it doesn't seem likely to succeed uh, at all, frankly. It's like bo bordering on frivolous and um, clearly implicated by the the PLCAA so uh barring some sort of shocking twist in in the case I, I don't think this is going anywhere and and um you know it, it, I don't know that it's going to be successful in trying to uh, alleviate political pressure back home I mean why does Arizona have a, a murder rate that's like a fifth of Mexico's if they're the problem that from, you know, if they're the cause of Mexico's violence, you know, it doesn't, doesn't make a lot of sense. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, this is not an uncommon thing to see. I mean, really, we talked about, uh, we covered Philadelphia uh, recently where they uh, passed a city ordinance banning guns in parks and rec centers that is illegal under state law and immediately got blocked by a state judge. And, they've been doing that forever. It doesn't do anything practically to um, stop the murders from occurring in Philadelphia, which has had over, over 400 this year, but it's perhaps, a, I guess it still seems to the mayor, uh, Mayor Kenny in Philadelphia to be a, uh, a useful political messaging tool, I, I guess, like the show that you're trying to fight, uh, but right you know, trying to tighten gun laws. Um, and that can be politically persuasive to some people. I mean, it keeps happening in Philadelphia and, and places like that because uh, presumably the constituents there are not upset about it, uh, even though they're, they always lose these cases. Um, so maybe that's going to happen in Mexico. You know, obviously we're not experts on the domestic political situation in Mexico. So right. I, I don't know. It just seems risky on uh, as far as international relations go uh, between Mexico and pro-gun uh, politicians in the United States.